So we got a comment that these little breakdown things were enjoyable and everyone else on YouTube is doing them. So figured why not hop in and do some of them too. I'm going to talk about the behind the scenes video clip that dropped from Amazon Prime on October 20th. And then I'm going to talk about the Who Are Rand and Moraine video clip that dropped on IGN as part of IGN's first series on the Wheel of Time yesterday for me, October 29th, for anybody trying to keep track. So let's just get into it, right? All right. So the first thing we see on this behind the scenes clip uh, that is shot very much in uh, portrait style, which I kind of love. Seems optimized for, for mobile views, and it really kind of gets that behind the scenes feel like this is something extra that was recorded for, for us to watch. First thing we see is one of those uh, scene clappers that is dated March 4th of 2020. Uh, so this would be over a year ago. And in the background, we see what looks to be uh, the Hall of the Tower, and it even looks like the kind of gold and white kind of flowing of the Amarlin seat Suan Sanchi's gown. And I think we even see a bit of her collar here in the shot right over the, uh, I'm no, I don't know stage hand or stage jobs, but the, the, the person with the clapper um, right over their left hand. Uh, the next scene we get is uh, a behind the scenes look at the way gate. We can see some scaffolding behind the way gate for use of, looks like there's also a propane tank uh, down at the bottom left of sorts or a gas tank of sorts it might be compressed air or something for uh, some practical effects for wind or then we might see some fire or something like that all right so next we get a behind the scenes action shot of the uh, Shinar and heavy cavalry uh, we can see like an SUV with a camera rig on top riding alongside all the horse riders in the cavalry and then in the, the next scene uh, we get uh, one of the I guess carts that you can affix camera rigs and stuff to uh, that's going in front of them so they can get the, the scene as if the camera's right in front of them moving backwards away from them. Um, so this is pretty cool. Pretty good look at the uh, the Shinar and Heavy Cavalry. Uh, the next little bit we get is a scene of Moraine and uh, Alana walking kind of through the Hall of the Tower, or not through the Hall of the Tower, Hall's in the Tower, and it looks like uh, the first part of this, because we see it from two angles, the first part looks like they're just walking down a hallway with uh, maybe warder statues uh, along either side. Various warders uh, line the halls, and at the end of the hall, there appears to be some red Aja sisters. Uh, when the scene turns around and we can see where Moraine and Alana are walking from, it almost kind of looks like the Hall of the Tower, but I'm not quite sure. We can see some doors but there's a man walking with him. So either he picked up right outside of the Hall of the Tower, and this is after whatever is called Moraine and Alana to the Hall of the Tower with Leandrin, or this is him going to it. Next, it cuts to a scene of Rosamund Pike as Moraine, kind of uh, what looks like mid-interview. This might be part of the behind-the-scenes information that we know Rafe has confirmed that we're going to get that we're going to get some behind the scenes kind of director cut style stuff. Um, this was found out whenever somebody asked if we were going to get a, a compiled um, release of all the composite or conceptual art. And Rave said that there was going to be some behind the scenes stuff that would be released um, either along with or after the show. I don't exactly remember which, but we are getting that. And that's, this looks like it's of the production quality that it would be a part of that. Uh, the next kind of key shot we get is uh, kind of from behind the seats when Moraine and Alana and Leandrin are in the Hall of the Tower. This looks like this is the scene leading up to the Amarillin seat arriving. Uh, she isn't in her throne at this point, and Moraine and Alana are kind of all curiously, they're, they're facing towards the brown Aja sitters, it looks like, just to the, if you're looking at the front of the Amarillin seat's throne, it's the sitters just to the left. Uh, which I believe are the brown scissors, the brown sitters, but the Amberlynn is not in this in this scene or in this shot. Uh, so this may be a shot of Perrin and uh, Layla Lewin, uh, who is rumored to be Perrin's wife in the show. And we've seen some other pictures of Perrin with uh, a ring on uh, in the U.S., what typically denotes uh, the wedding ring on the uh, left hand ring finger. So that might be the shot is here. And there looks to be some uh, lit kind of sails on little small like boats. Um, when I say small boats, you'll see whenever I put the picture out. But, you know, I mean, 
kind of like floating lanterns, but the paper kind of part of it looks like sails of boats. Uh, cuts next to uh, what is quickly becoming one of the most talked about parts of the TV show to come, uh, a shot of the White Cloaks. Uh, we see that they have these kind of pauldrons on their shoulders that kind of stick up maybe as guards uh, to kind of protect them. Um, I think we see Child Buyer in this scene. I think he's the one that is left of center, kind of behind the gentleman in front, uh, riding, uh, which begs the question of who the one in the front center is, and think it may be Valda. It does kind of look to me like uh, Abdul Salis who is the actor cast to play Eamon Valda. I don't see anybody in the crowd of White Cloaks that reminds me of Joel from Bornhold, who is played by uh, Stuart Graham, uh, but we very much may be seeing either an earlier rendition of, or maybe Child Buyers there with Valda. I'm not sure. Uh, it's an interesting choice if this is Valda. I don't remember Valda being this early in the series. So in the book series, Eamon Valda isn't mentioned until Fires of Heaven, but... They may be bringing him in early to help establish the character that is Eamon Valda for later on in the series. We may see some of the events for the White Cloaks happen a bit faster than we did in the series. So not sure about that. Based off of the trailer, which I'll be talking about in another video, uh, they're going to need all the chances for a redemption arc that they can get. Uh, but it is nice to see that the banners look really nice. They definitely have the sunburst that is common to the chapter icon images for the White Cloaks, or Children of the Light. Uh, whichever you prefer. Uh, next, we see uh, Rand, played by Joshua Stradowski, standing up in a tower. There's a bunch of smoke and fog kind of around. This is a stone construction with some statues. It makes me think Shadar Logoth. And of course, in behind the scenes images, we can see uh, all of the boom arms and everything that they're using for uh, camera angles and for recording and that kind of stuff. Um, next, we get a shot of the behind the scenes of Moraine channeling. Uh, looks like she's flinging uh, air or lightning bolt or something over off screen, uh, which makes it curious for the next shot, which we know is a, a misdirect that it just bleeds into the next shot very well. Uh, the shot of Kareem Nagashi being flung into the stone pillar that we saw from the teaser trailer and part of the low gain uh, teaser. Next, we get a fly in overhead shoot of Amon's field. We can see production uh, vehicles and production tents in the background, kind of the same pictures we saw. Uh, well, it looks very similar to a picture we saw as a leaked image of the shooting location. Uh, so kind of confirming that that was right, but we already we already knew that. Next, we get a panning shot uh, that, again, includes part of the boom arm uh, for a camera rig uh, where Lan and Rand and Matt and Perrin and uh, Nynaeve and Egwene and all are standing in front of the waygate. Uh, cuts to a scene of Moraine talking to the group uh, with Nynaeve kind of in the foreground uh Kind of looking over Nynaeve's left shoulder. A uh, quick shot of a Murdral riding on horse, and then a group of people running through the woods with an explosion behind them. Uh, I really like that because that means that is a practical effect. You can do that kind of stuff with very low grade explosives, um, very are uh, very strong concentrations of compressed air, that kind of stuff. Uh, this looks more like it's kind of a low grade concussive thing, like think something along the lines of probably a slightly souped up firework. And again, I'm not gonna go scene by scene for all this. I'm just gonna pull out scenes that I found very interesting or telling for one reason or another. Uh, we do get to see Rafe Judkins in the breakdown, kind of talking about the series and he's listed as the executive producer and showrunner, which we know, but Rafe, good to see your face. Uh, then we get to see Steppen and Nynaeve running through the woods. Steppen with his two half moon, uh, double-sided kind of half moon shaped well, battle axes. A lot of people are making comments about the construction of them that maybe they don't look that sturdy. I think they would be fairly sturdy, especially if they're power wrought. We'll see if that's something they do. Uh, the next we get is a kind of over third person shooter style shot almost of what looks like Tam facing a door as the door gets broken in uh, and Tam kind of reacting to it. So probably the scene where uh, Narg or another trollic burst into the farmhouse. Uh, one of the most talked about scenes from the background, uh, from the behind the scenes video, is a still of Tom with guitar sitting kind of on the edge of a table in uh, what looks to be a tavern. May or may not be the wine spring. I don't think it is, but I also haven't sat there and stared at all the screens from it. So if I'm wrong about that, let me know down below in the comments. But Tom, looking great. So next we get this scene of Rand and what looks like maybe a stunt double or stand-in for 
uh, for Egwene, who of course played by Madeline Madden. Uh, doesn't quite look like Madeline, but it could just be the lighting making it not necessarily look like Madeline Madden. Madeline Madden, Jesus. Maybe if I can get my names right, I'll be somewhere. But but yeah, that's that's kind of what I'm thinking. And it's definitely Egwene and Ran because there's a definite a definite closeness in this. So I, I would be surprised to find out if it's anybody other than Egwene and maybe just a stand-in for Madeline. Uh, next, we get a shot of Nynaeve, uh, of course, played by Zoe Robbins. She's holding her kind of infamous thumping stick, it looks like, in her left hand, and she's getting that kind of braid tug and then flinging it over her shoulder with her right hand and over her right shoulder. So uh, according to Rafe from the IGN uh, trailer breakdown, she just got done doing something pretty epic, so we'll see what that is. Uh, next, we get a behind-the-scenes shot of um, Egwene, emerging from the pool that we saw in the teaser trailer with all of the colors uh, kind of coming uh, over her face and kind of over all her garb and that kind of stuff. Um, in this scene, there's no colors in the pool, so those may be added later. This might have been a test run of the scene with the women's circle standing around, who knows. Uh, but that the colors are missing, but again, it's a behind-the-scenes shot. Maybe they're doing those after in After Effects. I doubt it given how the emphasis Rafe and team have put on practical effects. So next we get a shot of what I'm going to say is Bryn Spring. It looks similar to the Bryn Spring, Spring image that we see on the Explore section of the Amazon Prime site for the Wheel of Time. Uh, this definitely looks like Bryn Spring, and we can see someone dressed in red and maybe a white horse, not entirely sure. But it kind of zooms in on the shot a little bit. But this looks like Bren Spring to me, especially the area where the windmill is and the staircase down to the water. Um, and it ends, of course, with the uh, rotating in of the Great Serpent slightly and then the appearance of the Wheel of Time text. So that's it for the behind the scene. All right, changing gears now. We're going to move over and we're going to talk about the IGN first clip that is Who is Rand and Moraine? Spoiler alert, it talks about a lot more than Rand and Moraine. But it does start with that scene from uh, the trailer of Moraine standing on a balcony of the White Tower, kind of just looking over the world. And we do have uh, Rosamund Pike's fantastic voice as Moraine uh, to kind of guide us into this scene. So an epic line delivered there to grab your attention. Moraine saying that uh, she did not choose this path but she will follow it. Um, a scene from the trailer of Lana Moraine talking, Lana asking Moraine where next, and then Moraine saying the two rivers. Um, I'll get into more of that when we do our video on the trailer. I'm gonna focus this uh, on the kind of cast interviews that IGN was able to do with cast members. The Meet the Cast is gonna start off with Joshua Stradowski, who is playing Randall Thor. Uh, you can tell this was shot on scene, looks to be season one. Um, Yoshua's got some blood on his left ear. You can see he's wearing Rand's clothes underneath uh, a modern jacket, obviously to keep him warm during this interview, uh, because it appears that they were recording when it was quite cold. And from the time frames we know in the landscape, yeah, it was freaking cold. Um, so Yoshua starts off by saying that Rand is a sheep herder. So it's already clear to me that Yoshua Sadowski has Rand down packed. He knows that Rand follows his heart, that that can also cause Rand to make impulsive decisions that can make him appear stubborn. Uh, so spot on there, like we expected anything different. He doesn't see Rand as a hero. He's trying not to approach him that way. He's trying to approach him from a very human perspective uh, and just treat him as the character person that Rand is rather than coming at Rand as a hero or the hero or anything of that nature. Um, and he calls out that in his uh, in his boots for obviously the show, the label on them says Rand Hero, and he doesn't really care for it because he uh, he's not approaching Rand that way. He's not seeing that Rand. He's not seeing Rand that way, um, which I love. Mad respect for that. So next is Barney Harris as Matt, um, and he starts off talking about Matt um, being the kind of the comic relief, uh, which we saw a lot in the books, but delving more into the deep character of Matt. And an interesting take that the show is taking on Matt that I and I don't think many others glean from Matt in in the actual book series where Matt is struggling kind of with this inner monologue or inner dialogue of, am I a good person? Am I a bad person? Uh, and we kind of see that more in the Explore section of the Amazon Prime page for Wheel of Time, talking about Matt struggling with this question, am I good or bad? Um, and some implications that, you know, maybe Matt's parents aren't the best people after all. 
uh, can kind of glean some of that from the books because he gets into a lot of trouble, a lot of mischief, and never seems to change or really be reprimanded by anybody uh, within his family. Barney goes on to talk about uh, that some of this might be a byproduct of the poverty uh, that Matt lives in. Uh, Edmondsville is not a rich place. It is not. They, in comparison to many other places, would be considered to be living in poverty. It is not the richness that we see definitely in Tarvalon, but in other areas like Camelin or Tyr or anything like that. Uh, but the theme of impoverished persons is a very consistent and constant theme throughout the show, though we are through the series rather. I don't know about the show. Um, but throughout the series that we see uh, impoverished people all, all over the all over the place, very kind of caste system esque uh, kind of division amongst the people based off of you know wealth. Barney Harris nails the relationship between Rand and Matt. They've grown up together. Uh, they've known each other since they were kids. He describes them as very banterous with each other, and we see that very early on that there's a playful kind of fun banter back and forth between the two. So Barney mentions uh, he says that he finds both of them quite irritating, quite stubborn. I'm not sure why I'm friends with either of them. So I think there was a, the question here involved Perrin uh, to some extent, even though it's not expressly named in Barney's answer. But he's really kind of capturing Matt's kind of carefree-ish -ish nature, his willingness to just, you know, whatever happens, happens. And what seems like a very realistic view that Matt would have of Rand and Perrin as being very serious, potentially stubborn, not wanting to have any fun. Uh, which, you know, is an interesting question. You know, why exactly is Matt friends with them other than, you know, shared age and being around each other? But we find friends all the time that are very different from each other and make some of the best friendships. So next we get Marcus Rutherford talking about Perrin Ibarra, accurately portraying him as the gentle giant. I don't know anybody that would disagree with Perrin being a gentle giant of the series. Marcus Rutherford does a great job here, I think, in capturing uh, the kind of nuances of Perrin and his friendships with Rand and Matt that he believes that there's characteristics of each of them that the others need um wink wink to everybody that has finished the series uh because i'm trying not to really be spoiler here but um he highlights that and he mentions how you know Rand can be kind of impulsive uh how he can make decisions based off his heart but Perrin is more likely to kind of sit down and think things through before making a decision which is something we see often throughout the series even to the point of annoying us in the series Next is Roseman Pike talking about Moraine. And I, I loved every second of this section of the interview. Um, we already know from things that Moraine, or rather that Roseman Pike said, see, I already can't separate the two. Um, we already know from things that Roseman Pike has said in interviews and Q&As, like the one she did with Rafe, uh, and things Rafe has said about choosing Roseman Pike to play Moraine, that she gets Moraine. And I really love how she's, calling out and pointing out that kind of feeling that a lot of readers, I know I did when we first read it, where we're not exactly sure what Moraine's end game is. And there's a lot of time in the series spent like, where exactly is Moraine going with this? What is she doing? Um, and Roseman Pike has definitely picked up on that and has honed in on that, at least for uh, the first season when these interviews were shot, because um, it very much looks like they're using uh, maybe the Wine Spring Inn or another building in the prop set of the Two Rivers as the background for these interviews. Um, she confirms that more the Moraine in the show is designed expressly to keep the audience guessing, and that's what we want. I think as many things that there might be different about the show that fans of the series like or don't like, that it's that first-time experience of reading the first book where you probably know who is who, but you're not, inquire, you're not entirely sure. There could still be some guesswork going on that first time reading through where you don't know who is X, who is Y. Um, this very much sounds like the show is aiming for that to happen for the viewers as well. And we'll see if it does as good a job, a better job or a worse job than the series. And, you know, kind of keeping us guessing about Moraine. I know when I first read the series, I was like, is Moraine even a good person? Like she shows up and pays all the, all the young children in the two rivers and ultimately like, winds up taking some of them with her. I'm like that doesn't really sound like the start to a hero story, but it's it's interesting. The entire interview is just so gold. Like all all of this is just pure interview gold. She points out that you have to read and look at Maureen for multiple levels, that you're never quite sure exactly what she's doing. Um 
But once you get to know Moraine, she's very surprisingly warm, which is, is completely accurate. I mean, not again, like they're 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 on it. Um, and in between all the coaching they're getting, the fact that many of the cast uh, seem to be reading the series and are very, very, fairly far along in the series, you can tell already. So she also pulls out the the worldview aspect of the Aes Sedai that that in many areas they are thought to be monsters. They're thought that they should be feared. Uh, some areas think they're in league with the Dark One. Uh, looking at you, White Cloaks. But th- there are areas where they are indeed respected. So very, very good brief explanation of the worldview of the Aes Sedai. So she goes on to talk about Moraine's mission, that she's the character that we come into the series with that has a a very direct mission that a lot of Aes Sedai are trying to accomplish, and she's determined to be the one to accomplish it, uh, which definitely 100%, 100% Moraine, 100%. Um, if you never saw it before, go watch these interviews, and you'll be able to tell that all these char- all these actors and actresses are they're embodying the characters like the Rosamund Pike is Moraine. Next, we get Daniel Henney, who is playing Lan. Uh, of course, he knows who his character is. Lan is a warder, he is a guardian and a protector and, com- and companion uh, to Moraine. Uh, that is his job as a warder. He points out that you know that they're uh, bound together, that there's a relationship between the two of them. Um, and he automatically says, you know, that it's platonic. Uh, I love the phrasing that he uses. It's pretty funny. You know, there's nothing going on in between the sheets for these two. Um, So just a fan. Fantastic. So he also brings up that they have been traveling together to accomplish this quest of finding the dragon. And uh, from their view, they've been traveling town to town to town trying to find the dragon. He does this really nice um, um, call out for Lan that uh, that in his view, Lan is the perfect guy. And at the very least, someone that we could all strive to be like, which I think Almost everybody that's read the series would agree that, you know, that's part of the draw of Land, that he is such a good person. Uh, and we all have some aspect of ourselves that we want to be like Land. So next we get Zoe Robbins, uh, who plays Nynaeve, talking about Nynaeve. Uh, she references that Nynaeve goes on an incredible journey, which uh, abundantly accurate. Nynaeve's journey is incredible. The, the way the character evolves over the course of the series is incredible. And it seems like, you know, at the time whenever this... Uh, whenever these interviews were done, that Zoe Robbins is already well aware of that. I'm not sure if Zoe's reading the series or not. I hope she is, because uh, if nothing else, uh, if you love playing the character, I know you'll love seeing everything that happens in the series for yourself. But she she talks about uh, Nynaeve being very strong-willed, very forthright, that she speaks her mind, and that she does things her own way, um, sometimes, if not oftentimes, to the detriment or dismay of others around her. This is another instance where you can really see how well the uh, the people portraying the characters are connecting with the characters, and they kind of have to to do the series justice. And you can tell they're 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 really doing that very well. Um, she points out how Nynaeve becomes selfless, um, which she definitely does spot on there, and that she can also be unpredictable, um, and that. She's identified kind of the selfless part of Nynaeve as something that Zoe wants to work on and try to be better with in, in her life. I think Nynaeve is a good uh, instructor to all of us to try to work on being more selfless, more kind, more caring to those around us. So, yeah, they're, they're, if nothing else, there's a moral lesson for you from this. So, uh, next interview we have is, of course, Madeline Madden, who is playing Egwene. And... Madeline is everything I expected to see in Egwene. Um, she's very energetic. She's very mobile in the interview. You can tell she's. Ex- it looks like she's very excited to talk about Egwene, which is fantastic. I think we're all excited to talk about Egwene whenever we can. Uh, we're all excited to talk about in- almost any character in the series as often as we can. So it's great to see that kind of energy expressed in an interview about the character and kind of about the character that she's playing. So she's already identified that Egwene is very ambitious, that she's very much a keen learner, things of that nature. Um, I, I love it. So she also calls out kind of a Gwen's thought process whenever she's leaving the two rivers. It's kind of this decision, you know, as a, as the person in training to take over as the village wisdom or to be another village wisdom, do I stay behind and do what I can in the village to make everybody in the village happy? Or do I go beyond the village and give what I can outside of the village 
Um, and we know that Egwene has a fair bit of, of, of wanderlust. She wants to go out. She wants to travel. She wants to see the world. And she very much wants to learn what she can. And it's nice in the books to see uh, Egwene follow her nature and her heart and leave the two rivers. I mean, something that she probably just hasn't done yet because there hasn't been an avenue. I mean, what are you going to do? Hop on Pat and Fane's wagon and travel the world? Probably not the best idea. So she points out that uh, you can tell about Egwene that there's some, uh, as she says, electric energy inside of her that you really want to follow her journey. And you can see it because the, the whole interview, uh, Madeline is very animated. She's very mobile. She's very into the interview. And it seems like she reacts the same way that any time any fan reacts whenever somebody's like, oh, hey, I started reading the Wheel of Time series. Uh, you know, I finished Eye of the World and I want to talk about it. And we're like, yes, let's talk about it. Let's do it. Um, we get very excited about those kinds of things. So, and it's it's nice to see that the the, the people portraying the characters um, seem to be very much the same way about the characters. They seem very excited and into the interviews. And you know, I didn't see any of them not smiling or looking at it as like this was a, a chore or a drag to do. All right, so that's it for the interviews. We got interviews with Joshua Shadowski, with Barney Harris, with Marcus Rutherford, with Daniel Henney, Rosamund Pike. Zoe Robbins and Madeline Madden there. Um, basically the kind of core seven that looks like we're going to focus on a lot. Um, but definitely the core seven that we focus on in uh, at least book one of the book series. Can't wait to see some more of these cast interviews come out uh, for Loghain and Loyal, Agomar, Uno, who it looks like maybe we get to see in the trailer. Um, just so many more cast interviews to be done hopefully i can't wait to see them hopefully we see them very soon keep your eyes out ign uh fantastic job ign first it seems to be putting out a bunch of content and they project to put out a bunch of content about the wheel of time so keep your eyes out there obviously uh the wheel of time twitter account is probably going to be tweeting those out if the amazon prime uh, or the prime video accounts don't as well so keep your eyes out on twitter keep your eyes out on uh all the kind of news sites like watseries.com uh, winter is coming.net is covering a lot of this stuff too dusty wheel is doing a live stream on pretty much everything that comes out in one way shape or form so uh, definitely pay attention to the interwebs there's so many people talking about it and uh, we're all just excited to be able to talk about it and be able to show things in the videos rather than just talking about what we get from the book series of what we're inferring from the series to come hopefully you enjoyed this video a little bit of a breakdown of two of the clips. Again, later today, I'm going to try to record one talking about the trailer and maybe breaking down the trailer and keep your eyes out for that. Again, let me know what you think in the comments below. If there's anything I didn't uh, touch on or something that I missed that you think I should have touched on, let us know in the comments below. Love seeing the comments section blow up down below with uh, hopefully kind comments. But, you know, do what you got to do. Just be nice to each other. You know, Be like naive. Strive to be selfless and be a good person.